We're going to talk about sheet pile walls now. This would be the last new material. Um, so sheet pile walls are almost always st structural steel that are mashed into the ground and they interlock together. So oftentimes they'll have this sort of corrugated pattern to them. Here's some sheet pile walls that are being vibrated into the ground with an excavator with a special attachment for gripping onto these things. Now this excavator doesn't have as much downward pressure to be able to push these into the ground. Uh, it's likely that this thing is going to vibrate. I can't say for sure that this thing is going to vibrate, but vibration helps mash it into the ground, but uh, still doesn't have a lot of downward capacity. So in this case, they're actually using this auger to pre-drill the hole. So they're basically augering in a line to loosen the material up before they smash the sheet pile down into the ground. Here's a crane delivered sheet pile system. So uh, there's eccentric weights inside of this thing and they're vibrating up and down and that helps drive the sheet pile into the ground. Sheet piles are very common in um, near, near water because if, if, this, if you were to try and build this with a geotech wall or something like that, uh, you'd have to drain the thing and that's just not gonna be very feasible. Um, there's also this really cool system from Geekin um, you can go check it out. There's a pretty cool video of this system being delivered from on top of the sheet pile wall. Uh, it, it's, it's not particularly special in the picture that you see here, but they, they've actually got video of this thing driving out into the middle of a bay. So you can start at the edge of the bay and then drive out to the middle of the bay as you're putting sheet piles as you go. Um, so in order to install the sheet piles, you need to have a structural element uh, created by a steel manufacturer. So the best, um, or one of the best design guides is from USA Steel. It's been uploaded and uh, basically they're trying to sell their sheet piles and so they want to make it user friendly. And so we've got to come up with things like moment of inertia for the moment capacity calculations and uh, we want to try and get the most efficient design. But you can see in the figure the way that uh, they interlock together. So some of them have a male and a female end and then some of them naturally interlock with each other. Um, and so there's different uh, kind of systems that are set up for, uh, for using these. So uh, failure mechanisms are, uh, there's quite a few actually because it's, it's kind of like a geotech wall. There's more moving parts uh, than there is for example, a gravity wall. So the first uh, approach is just an undercutting where you get a failure uh, plane that goes underneath of the bottom of the wall and this thing sort of kicks out. And that can happen with or without uh, a tie. And we're not going to try and design these but I'll show you kind of the design methodology for them. Here's another possible failure mechanism and that's sort of a rotation about a point and um, so that, that's one, another failure mechanism. And uh, also potentially if there's a tieback, it uh, could rotate around the base of the tieback. So you would end up with sort of a failure of the base heaving. Uh, and then there can be structural failures. So this would be a failure of the, the structural element of steel. And so uh, maybe the moment capacity at this location is not high enough and so you can uh, get the wall falling over or if there's a tie back the it turns out that the, the highest moment capacity or moment demand uh, in the section is is right uh, about there um, you can all, these are all failures of the tie back system so um, we'll see in a later figure that there's sort of a wedge of soil that's trying to be driven upwards and if that wedge of soil is too short or too small then you can actually pull out the tie back. Uh, of course, the structural steel element that is tying back the, the wall to the dead man is potentially a failure point or a failure uh, where the connection happens at the facing. So um, the way that this method, there's, there's two approaches I'm gonna show you. Um, we're gonna briefly talk about the analytical method and then I'll show you some design chart methods and we'll talk a little bit more about that. But if we're gonna do uh, the, the design chart, met the analytical method, then it's helpful to take a first guess at what the depth would be so that we can come up with some analysis. And so here's, here's some guesses. 
Um, so this is the general soil pressure distribution. Um, and it's fairly complicated to, to look at at first, but once you kind of get the sense of what's going on, it's not as complicated. So the idea is that we're going to assume in this particular geometry without a tieback that this thing is going to rotate about 0 0.0. And so um, everything above 0 0.0 is moving to the left. And, and if that's true, then the soil on the right side here that's got this triangular pressure distribution um, is in the active state. So it's actively failing, and that means we would use K active to calculate the horizontal pressure at that location. And uh, there's a break in slopes here because we're assuming that the groundwater table would be at the dredge line. Um, now on the other side of the wall, so over here on, uh, on the dredged side where the water table's at, um, that's all gonna be passive pressure and up until you get to the point of rotation. So once you get below the point of rotation, uh, now the, the soil on the left side is, is in the active state. So the wall is moving away from the soil on the left side below point O. And so that means that on the right side, it's in the passive state. So they add this dotted line to kind of just help us understand um, how pressure is being, how, where is this pressure distribution coming from? Now this is great and we could do the analysis like this, but uh, it, it turns out that uh, there's a simpler way to look at it, which is to think about subtracting uh, the pressures that are on both sides because the, those pressures, those forces, they're canceling each other out to some degree. And so if you cancel them out, you get a pressure distribution that looks something more like this. So I'm not going to go through this as an example, but if you are interested in it, you can go take a look at the USA Steel Manual or the other uh, sheet pile manual. I think that's Army Corps of Engineers that I posted. And basically what you're going to do here is you're going to do some quick analysis based on the slope of these lines. So the slope of the lines just have to do with the, the relationship between active pressure and passive pressure. And so um, we can calculate this magnitude and we know the slope of this line. So uh, what we can do is we can actually figure out when we're gonna get to the point of what's called zero shear. And that's where the forces on both sides sort of cancel each other out and there's essentially no shear within the uh, structural element. And it, as if you remember back to uh, your intro structural design kind of material that the location with zero shear is gonna be the location with the most moment. And so that's also the location of the most moment so we would do our analysis there to try and find out what the structural capacity would be needed for the moment capacity in the, in the section. Um, so once you get that section set up, um, you can extend that line out and you go to the bottom of your pile and you can start at this point and extend it back and, and you can do a sum of forces at that point until you figure out exactly when the sum of forces is equal to zero. Um, and determine if your depth is is enough. And once you once you determine that to be a factor of safety of one, uh, then what you can do is you can extend that down by 20 to 40 percent to get something like a factor of safety. Uh, simpler approach, or maybe it's it's uh, all that same material boiled down to a graphical method. There's a built-in assumption uh, that the unit weight of the soil is equal to two times the buoyant unit weight. And that's not always true. It kind of depends on the unit weight of the soil. That's usually not true, but it's a safe uh, kind of middle ground position to take. And so once you make that assumption, you can use this chart. All right. So the chart, uh, we want to start by looking at the bottom here where it shows the ratio of K passive over K active. So that's a soil friction question. What's the friction angle of the soil? And you can go into that and, uh, you know, it's, it's a soil property basically. Uh, so let's say that you had a, a ratio of seven. Okay, so that's the soil property and we're saying that it's the same soil on both sides. Uh, then we need to look at this figure to determine the geometry. So the height component is probably specified as a design requirement. And your real question, what you're trying to find out is what's D supposed to be? Another thing that's likely to be a design requirement is alpha. So, uh, you know, a safe condition would be that uh, the water table's at the bottom because the water table is going to have a tendency to stabilize the wall because it's going to reduce the pressure uh, on, 
above the water tip. It's gonna reduce the pressure uh, above the dredge line. So uh, likely alpha, which is just telling us where the water table is gonna be at, uh, is gonna be a design property or a design requirement also. Um, so based on that, uh, you, you decide, okay, so we've got uh, a known alpha and we've got a known H. So let's say our alpha is one, that means that the water table is at the dredge line and that our uh, K, KP over KA is seven. So we can go up and where we intersect with that, we can go over to get the depth ratio. So the depth ratio is just gonna tell us how deep this thing needs to be. And so in this case, um, you know, we need to have our depth around 1.7 times whatever this height dimension is that's given in the problem statement. And then you would just take that depth and add 20 to 40% to it to get your factor of safety. So that's uh, on the depth ratio curve. There's another set of curves here and those have to do with the moment ratio. So what is the, the moment ratio is gonna tell us what the structural capacity needs are for our section. So we've got soil properties and geometric properties uh, that help us normalize this chart. But once we get the chart normalized, now it works for everything. And so again, we would start at our known position in the KP over KA and go up to our alpha that was also known so we would just continue to that point and then come over and it would tell us what the moment is that we need. So now what we can do is we can figure out how deep that uh, structural steel section needs to be in order to uh, be considered safe. Now, uh, same thing if there's an anchor force. Um, so it's the same idea. We've got this uh, net soil pressure distribution that's drawn. And, but in this case, we're assuming that it's gonna rotate about this particular point right here. And so now the geometry of these triangles are a little bit different. Um, but again, we can go through and solve for what D needs to be and then extend that 20 to 40%. Now that you can do that same thing uh, in a chart uh, scenario, but we can also figure out what our ankle, anchor tension is gonna need to be, um, which is helpful for design, I mean, you could at least do it this way as a first guess and then come up with some cost estimates and then go to an owner and say, hey, this is kind of what we think it will cost. And then uh, after that, you could go back and do the more analytical design and get a, maybe a little bit more savings. I, I mentioned this idea of passive pressure within the soil wedge. Uh, and so there's some guidance on where that needs to be. Um, so, so this is basically the active wedge, um, and here is a passive wedge, and they're calling out that these two had better not intersect, right? So you need to make sure that the anchor is long enough that our passive wedge uh, for the dead man doesn't somehow interact with the active wedge of, of the soil uh, behind, the, behind the sheet pile wall. Um, and then, and then we need to determine. So we need to size the active wet, the the dead man, just like we would uh, a retaining wall. So essentially, we've got a passive wedge and an active wedge. So this would be a similar approach to how a foundation works. So if we've got a foundation, there's an applied shear force, and on one side there's a passive uh, there's a passive resistance, and then on the act on the on the back side there's actually soil that's helping to push the foundation along. It's the same thing with this uh, particular setup. Uh, they're, they're calling out a possibility for cohesion. Again, I'm not trying to make us experts on this. I just want to give you some uh, kind of intro. If you, if you want to get some experience with this, again, go to the design manuals. They're pretty uh, involved. So the USA Steel manuals around 100 pages and the Corps of Engineers manual, I think it's like 400 pages. Um, other details have to do with connection design or the potential for a grouted uh, anchor. So it's, it's, it's possible that we can cant these anchors downwards to prevent them from needing to go uh, laterally so far. So there may be some res some restraints on your construction site. Um, so you can put some angle on it. And, and uh, the, the co they're calling out here that you would bond or grout only the section that's outside of the active wedge. So this is the active wedge. So it's very much like um, the way that we did our analysis for mechanically stabilized earth wall 
uh, effective length of reinforcement. So there's that active wedge is trying to fall down and then the reinforcements are going through that and just on the stuff that's outside of the active wedge are we gonna get contribution to the structural capacity. Different uh, geometries for securing uh, whales, which are the structural elements to the sheet piles. Uh, one is hidden, um, but would be harder to construct um, and, and requires all of these bolts to be placed in tension um, to, to get our capacity. Whereas uh, the whale here is outside of the retaining wall, so it's not gonna be probably as aesthetically pleasing and it's possible that a barge could smash into it and break it, um, but then we don't have to count on the, 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 the tension inside of these bolts. Uh, so there's probably some, there's gonna be some advantages and disadvantages. Uh, you can build coffer dams with these two. It's really uh, kind of a cool setup. Uh, you can drive a bunch of piles all the way around in a circle and create sort of a tension membrane effect or a compression membrane effect and then excavate within that or backfill inside of it and, and kind of build up a platform. And depending on what you're going for, you may end up needing uh, to have like a triangular shape. So they've got all of these different types of connections that you can use depending on what geometry of sheet, sheet pile wall you're looking for. So there's a, there's a low water dam that impounds water on the Kansas River for the Kansas City Power and Light. Um, it's not KCPNL, it's the, um, the water district in Kansas City. And uh, so they built one of these to make a low water dam. And they were able to go out during, this is a you know pretty high flow river during flooding conditions. They were able to go out when it was relatively dry and work on the thing and then just pull their equipment back whenever there was gonna be a flood is a pretty efficient system.